that's the way we roll. Through. So let me talk a little bit first before we get into to the specifics about the IRP, a little bit about the strategic framework, kind of the policy framework. Our CEO, Mr. Johnson, likes to remind us we got like four big drivers for what we're doing here at TVA. We've got to be conscious about our rate levels and about keeping our rates affordable for the folks that we serve here in the Tennessee Valley. We have to be mindful of our debt levels so that we kind of live within our means like we all do in our own household budgets. We have a stewardship obligation. We go beyond just making electricity. It's one of the reasons I came to TVA at first because there's more to us than just power generation. And lastly, we have a responsibility as it relates to our asset portfolio to make good decisions about what to keep and what to retire and how to use those in a responsible way. All four of those kind of drivers get addressed in one way or another by the analytics that we'll do in the IRP program uh, and, and throughout the process that we're using. So it's important for all of us to remember that we've kind of got that framework around what we're doing. So that as we began to hunt for the preferred resource plan, what we're going to recommend to the board that we try to do that, conscious that we've got those four kind of large objectives that we're trying to balance. So the process itself uses a lot of sophisticated analytics, and we're not going to get into all of that tonight, but I want to talk to you kind of on the process side about exactly how are we going to do this. We start out with two sort of parallel processes that you see up there in the left, top left of that chart, that flow graph. We begin by thinking about alternative futures. It says future worlds here on the slide. It's those the way that the future might turn out. We're not trying to predict the future. What we're trying to do is identify a bunch of different futures that might be plausible so that TVA will know how do we uh, perform in those alternative plausible futures. So we work through a process of trying to imagine those futures by trying to identify things that are uncertain that we then think drive our business decisions, things like how much power are our customers going to use in five years? What's going to be the cost of the fuel that we have to buy to burn in our power plants? Things like that that are unknowns right now that we forecast those things, but they are uncertainties. So we use those to help us. We use assumptions about those to help us frame these alternative <coughs> futures. At the same time, we're also trying to think about our own business plans, what sort of business strategy does TVA want to emphasize or maybe de-emphasize as we go out in the future. We want to look at those strategies by picking various attributes of our resource portfolio, things that we have control over, like we want to do a lot more energy efficiency, for example, or we want to do something about our coal fleet. Those are kind of the controls on the strategy design. They're what we call in the, in the slide attributes and constraints. We come up with these sets of business plans. Then the modeling is all involved in taking those future alternatives, taking those business strategies that we've come up with, and basically crossing them so that we see how those strategies perform in each one of those alternative futures. So the model requires, in addition to all that information, of course, all the data about the various technologies we might be evaluating, all the other assumptions that go into our models, like what the cost of electricity might be in the area around TVA, what our financing rates could be over time. We do this over a long period of time, typically 20 or 30 year uh, planning studies. So what you see over there, on the, if we get to the right of that slide, is what comes out of the model is something that we call portfolios. They're basically power supply plans. They're 20-year plans for what kind of resources we will add and retire and what the cost of those plans are. And then the one thing that we know for sure as resource planners is that we love to do very complex things, but we're always wrong because what we use is a forecast of the future. And so part of what we do in order to bound our errors is we do a lot of risk analysis around those uncertainties. So we build a lot of probability distributions around what we think our customer's energy consumption is going to be. 
or around what we think the price of natural gas might be. And then we use a different model to test all those probabilities in various combinations to make sure we know what our risk exposure is for almost every possible combination of what happens to power prices, what happens to natural gas prices, what happens in our own uh, territory, what happens outside our territory. Because what we're trying to do, remember, is get to a least regrets kind of a plan. Some place where almost regardless of what happens, we've got a sustainable future as, uh, as an electric utility. So that's what kind of comes out of the portfolio risk analysis. And one of the things we can also do when we do all that work is we can generate a lot of information, a lot of detailed analytics that's almost impossible to sort through all that. And so we employ a scorecard technique to make sure that we uh, identify those strategies that make sense in the most number of alternative futures. So the scorecard is a way to go about doing that. And we engage with our stakeholder working group to help us figure out what metrics ought to be on that scorecard. What things are important to us? Is it cost? Is it the environmental impact? Is it something about jobs? What is it that we think is most important? And we put those metrics on this scorecard and then we weight them and then we take the data out of all those runs that come out of our models and we populate this scorecard. And those of you who have looked at our uh, results from the 2011 study know what those scorecards look like. They're little red, yellow, and green cards that we look at that help us tell what's quote, good and what's bad. So the scorecard, again, is a way to help us interpret that. The other advantage to the scorecard is it allows everybody to be engaged in the discussion. You don't have to know the details in the planning models to be able to look at the scorecard and say, that one's good or that one's bad, or I'd like to trade off this one against that one. So it helps to more fully engage all of our stakeholder communities in trying to come up with the recommendation. At the end of the day, where we're headed is another sort of general roadmap. We've used this analogy before, and so you see it on this slide too, that the IRP is like a multi-lane highway. We're not going to be deciding what lane we're driving in, but we are going to decide we're going to be on this highway going this direction. So that's kind of the process of how we go about doing the IRP. Now, scenarios and strategies are a couple of things I already mentioned, and I, I should have started by apologizing. I'm a planner, so I'm full of lingo. Okay, and so I use a lot of terminology that makes perfectly good sense to me, but might not make sense to like an ordinary person. So as I go through here, if you've got questions about that kind of stuff, be sure and ask those so that I can go back and clear this up. Because uh, we want people to be uh, only as confused as we need you to be, not any more confused. <laughs> so if I'm confusing you, let me know. But the framework that we use is called a scenario planning framework. So again, like I said, a scenario is an alternative view of the future. It's not a prediction of the future, it's the way the future might be able to turn out. And it's made up of things that we can't control. I've already mentioned some of those, like our customers' use of power, fuel prices, things like that. We imagine a scenario about the way that might play out over 30 years, and then we imagine another one, and then we imagine another one. And the idea is to get a whole set of these things so that you can test our business strategies against a lot of different futures. Okay? Strategies, on the other hand, are stuff that we can control. It's decisions that we make all the time and will make in the future. Things about how are we going to invest in energy efficiency and how much are we going to invest in that? What are we doing about our nuclear projects? Are we going to continue to look at nuclear expansion? What about solar and other renewables? How do those get integrated? All of those things are deliberate decisions that we can make that we have some control over. And so they make up sort of the design parameters of the strategies. So when we mock up a strategy, what we want to do is find out how it performs in various futures so we know whether to commit to that strategy or not. So the central technique or the central kind of pivotal idea in scenario planning is you have to get good views of the future that are distinct enough that represent a broad enough set of different ways the future could turn out so that your analysis doesn't end up telling you the same thing over and over.
We have obviously alternative futures around our current set of assumptions, our current approach to the way we look at the future right now. We have assumptions, then those next two are kind of the polar opposites of each other. We have uh, we had a number of scenarios that were around declining economy. What happens if the economy doesn't recover? And then on the flip side, what happens if it does? And it does that in kind of an aggressive way. Then we have a group, uh, we had a group of scenarios that were head that were kind of gathered up under this whole thing about stringent environmental regulations. What happens if the regulatory framework gets a lot more aggressive? How does that change the future? And then finally, we have this changing paradigm category where we're recognizing a lot of things are happening in our industry that are going to fundamentally change the way we operate as a utility and the way our customers use our product. So about halfway through our design phase, we probably had about 20 or 25 scenarios in those five buckets. And we worked them down to this list that we talked through with our stakeholders and they helped us with some ranking and evaluation exercises and we ended up with these five. Uh, one future called the current outlook, which obviously is the current outlook. We have a prolonged stagnant national economy scenario. We have one that we call economic boom where we've got some growth going on. We have a decarbonized energy future scenario and then lastly we've got one called customer driven competitive resources. So this next slide is a kind of an explanation, if you will, a little bit more about those five alternative futures. So if we start at the top of that table on the left, the current outlook is our current view of the future. How is the future going to play out? What is it going to look like? What sort of constraints and costs do we assume about that current future? Then we look at the second one is about what happens if the national economy essentially stays flat or maybe goes slightly negative over a period of time. How does that affect our decisions as an electric utility in terms of investments in resources, retention of older units, all that kind of stuff. And that period of time for the stagnant inflate and stagnant case, we're thinking probably loads are going to stay flat or negative for probably about 10 years or so before there might be some recovery. So it's it's like the first 10 years of our planning window we're going to have uh, this depressed economy. The flip side of that is okay, what happens if the economy starts to recover and begins to pick up some momentum? Uh, how would we react in a situation like that? So that's what the economic boom uh, scenario looks at. Then in this decarbonized energy future, what we've imagined is that the economy is healthy enough, people are using energy, but for whatever reason, things have come together in a way that the federal government decided that we really need to tighten up on greenhouse gases and especially on carbon and so what happens is a series of fairly stringent regulatory requirements are put together that really put a significant penalty on carbon and begin to drive the industry obviously away from fossil generation and essentially incentivize either low emitting or no emitting kind of resources and so that's a future again that we have to be able to live in and then the last one on customer driven uh, is really uh, started from uh, our recognition that this is happening today in our business, that our large commercial customers and residential customers are beginning to feel like they want to take charge of their own energy future. So what strategies do we want to map out? Well, we use a process very similar to the process we use for scenario development to design our strategies. We start by thinking about, okay, what's our current resource mix look like right now? and where do we think it's either headed or where does it need to head and once we kind of get a sense of that we start thinking about all right so what components in that resource plan are the things that i need to be able to kind of dial up it's sort of like the knobs if i want to adjust this thing what do i need to adjust versus what maybe i don't have to work on quite as hard and so those components of my resource portfolio like if I'm very concerned about how much energy efficiency I'm going to have in my plan going forward, that might be one of those things that I want to be able to adjust. Whereas my conventional hydro fleet right now that's generating electricity from the Tennessee Valley, I'm probably not going to be doing a lot of messing around with that. I just want that to keep operating the way that it is now. So I try to find those things that I need to tune, and those things become sort of the 
parallel to the uncertainties in the scenario design process where we made these building blocks. These things become what we call attributes. So then what I have to do is I have to describe my planning strategy in terms of these attributes. So I, again, I create a story again, just like I created a story for the scenario. But this is a story about what I can do as TBA or what I might choose to do. And so we're about in stage three of that process right now with our stakeholders. We're still working through some of the ideas around a set of proposed planning strategies. We have about eight of them currently on the table with our uh, with our stakeholders. They've suggested another two or three we might think about. So we're scratching our heads and actually we're going to be meeting tomorrow and the next day uh, talking through some of that issue and trying to come up with what can we get to a short list on strategies similar to the short list we got to in scenarios. Once we get there we'll be able to mock them up uh, the same way that we're in the process of doing for uh, for the scenarios. So since we're still in that process and that's uh, kind of where we are right now, I want to spend a minute or two more talking about exactly how that works or at least a little closer to exactly how it works. So what you want to think about these attributes are the design parameters that we want to control in our resource mix. So what they're going to do is they're going to end up defining kind of the sides and the size of a box. Because what we want to do is we want to solve for the best plan that goes in that box. And so you might say, well, why, why, why even have a box? Why not just let the model pick whatever it wants to? Well, sometimes you have to put constraints and boundaries in these models to make sure that you get something that's either realistic or something that at least recognizes your minimum commitments. So, for example, I got a couple examples on that slide there. There's only so many generating units that are in our resource mix, what things are the most important to us? What do we want to have knobs sticking out of so that we can work on and turn those into attributes? So that's what those highlighted items are. You see there's 10 of them there. Nine resources plus this transmission grid improvement thing. So let me just walk you down from the top to the bottom so you get a sense of what those things are. Transmission grid improvements is at the top of this list because it's something that we're adding new this time in the IRP. Typically, we don't optimize transmission investment at the same time we're trying to do resource optimization. But we're going to give this a shot this time because this block is not about the transmission investments you make for reliability. It's about the transmission investments you make for economics. This is about could I build a transmission line instead of a power plant? and allow me to import power from someplace else that's cheaper? Or could I build a transmission line across my system from one side to the other to allow me to move power more economically so I don't have to build a generator on the other side of the system?